But too many people are focusing on supplements. A supplement is not going to regulate high cortisol levels. If your cortisol levels are high, your body's telling you something. And if you try to take a supplement to drop them, but you haven't changed anything in your life with the food you're eating that are causing it, that's a recipe for disaster. It's like uh, Lita Lee says, I'll read from a quote here I posted on Facebook, taking an adrenal glandular when hypothyroid and in a hypercortisol, hypercortisol state will increase the problems of hypothyroidism. Just like when people are in a state of adrenal fatigue, we could say they have super high cortisol levels or super low cortisol levels. They're in that phase where they're vitamin A deficient, T3 deficient, they can't convert cholesterol, even cholesterol deficient. Taking T3 or even a, a thyroid glandular can actually stimulate the system too much and the adrenal glands can't keep up because the adrenal glands regulate the availability of the fuel. The thyroid regulates the burning of the fuel. So if you take a glandular and the, and the adrenals aren't working the way they should because you're not you know, uh, meeting your metabolic needs nutritionally and filling your reserves with glycogen and things like that, then you can cause hyperstimulation of them when they're quote unquote not working or fatigued, which can actually make your problems worse. And this is why a lot of people, when they take glandulars or T3, they get a super increased heart rate and they get insomnia. So they should be working on the food first to kind of downregulate, you know, the excess cortisol the excess adrenaline, or feed the reserves of cholesterol, vitamin A, and T3 through regulating oxidative metabolism, meaning the right types of foods that contain sucrose and things like that, non-inflammatory proteins and fats, and then maybe add a glandular. But by that point, most of the time, you don't need it. So you have to think about these things. Then you have the third part, which is the zona reticularis, which produces your sex steroids. And typically, this helps to convert, and it uses cholesterol, which requires vitamin A and T3, which is huge in this. Uh, to make you sex steroids, which are used for many different, you know, things in the body. And this is why it doesn't make sense if we kind of go on a little tangent. Why, you know, when women get organs taken out and they say, and doctors say, well, you need estrogen because you had your female organs taken out. It doesn't really make sense because it's been shown through research and Dr. John Lee that when they get these, you know, uh, organs taken out that produce their female hormones as they age, a lot of the time progesterone drops to the bucket. The problem is, Estrogen is produced and stored in fat cells. So the heavier you are, the more estrogen you're going to produce. Most women are having a hard time detoxifying estrogen because they're not eating enough or the right types of anti-inflammatory proteins, which helps the liver detoxify estrogen. At the same time, your adrenal glands are still producing estrogen. So why do you need to take estrogen? I don't think, I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling you to stop, just remember that, but I don't think... I don't care any situation that there's, there's no situation and no reason that women should be taking estrogen at all. If anything, if they need it, maybe progesterone, but I don't think it, at all people should be taking estrogen for many reasons, from stimulating cortisol, inhibiting thyroid conversion, um, overburdening the liver, wasting glucose, wasting B6, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So when we have a stress, it stimulates the, you know, the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system. We release... Uh, catecholamines like adrenaline. Now, I've talked about this before, how when you're not meeting your nutritional needs with food frequencies, the right ratios at each meal and at the end of the day to regulate blood sugar, and you can see this with body temperature and pulse. And you see this because people with low pulses are typically hypercortisol. Cortisol lowers their pulse and lowers the conversion of T4 to T3, which lowers their, their um, body temperature. People that are hyperadrenaline, you know, the more stage 3 adrenal fatigue, um, you release adrenaline to mobilize glycogen initially. And usually there's not enough stored in the liver to mobilize. And that's short-lived. So the body says, I need, to, I need help. So it pulls in cortisol to glucocorticoid, glucoglucose to regulate blood sugar through gluconeogenesis. We break down proteins and fats to try to convert them into glycogen so we can get glucose at the cell level because our cells need um, glucose, T3, and vitamin A to make CO2 and ATP and energy. And cholesterol needs that to actually help with the conversion into steroidal hormones like pregnenolone and cortisol, etc. So you can see how in the end, if you don't have those, you can actually be cortisol deficient. So when you end in that stage, you know, the body says, well, I need, I need glycogen, I need glycogen. So it's constantly trying to release adrenaline. And this is why people in the, in the later phases will have high blood pressure, a high pulse, but also a high temperature above 85 beats per minute. So we know the temperature is being driven by adrenaline. So you can see the differences there with hyperadrenaline and hypercortisol. So initially, when we're not meeting our metabolic needs, which is more um, your stage one, 
uh, we become hypercortisol because the body needs that at the cell level. You know, it's been shown that in the liver, according to um, Philip Young, the deodinase enzyme is actually dependent on glucose to make T3. So the availability of T3 converted in the liver, which is 90% peripherally, is dependent on the amount of glycogen stored in the system by the liver. So if we just get an understanding of what cortisol is, it's a glucocorticoid, it mobilizes energy to increase glucose by the breakdown of proteins. It can suppress gastric emptying, shown by Hans Selyer, and down-regulate absorption and HCL secretion and pancreatic enzymes by up to 50%. You have all these people taking supplements and gut problems, when in a sense they're hypocortisol because they're not regulating their blood sugar, and they're basically hypothyroid. So you're focusing on the branch of a deeper-rooted issue, which is the cell which directs everything in the body. It inhibits sex hormone production, alters thyroid conversion, and suppresses the immune system. And it actually depletes the body of magnesium and zinc. And loss of magnesium and things like that are, are hallmark signs of hypothyroidism. You have adrenaline, which is a catecholamine, which in increases heart rate, respiratory rate, increases blood sugar, decreases insulin release, prevents glucose uptake, increases free fatty acids and cholesterol in the blood. But free fatty acids, according to P.J. Randall in 1963, actually inhibits cellular respiration. So you can see how, in a sense, now of course it's a YouTube, you've got to do more investigation into this through my YouTubes and other people's works, but you can see how it'll be much more effective to work on food to regulate T3 production, the cell's use of it to produce energy, to regulate overall energy production, to indirectly heal the adrenals, rather than just focus on the adrenals themselves. Now at the same time, like I mentioned, there's certain things like estrogen, prolactin, serotonin that can stimulate ACTH production. Um, so we have to think about that. Now according to Hans Selye, he showed that estrogen mimicked the first phase of the stress reaction. We have to think about that. You know, anytime you have a blood sugar handling issue, Estrogen typically is going to go up. And if we can't detoxify estrogen, which most people have issues with, it's going to waste glucose, which puts you in the hypoglycemic state, which stimulates cortisol. But he showed that estrogen mimics the first phase of the stress reaction. Excess estrogen, or the inability to detoxify it, or any stress, causes the pituitary to secrete prolactin and ACTH, um, and both tell the ovaries to stop progesterone production. Makes a lot of sense. So it's really not the steal of pregnenolone that's the problem. It's the excess production of or stimulation. Um, or we should say it's, it's the stress reaction. It could be estrogen. It could be prolactin. It could be serotonin. It could be ACTH. It could be cortisol. But all these things basically tell the body to stop producing progesterone. Because if you think about it, when you're in a stress state, if we just kind of boil it down and you're running from a lion, as most books say, uh, you're not thinking about eating food, you're not thinking about digesting food, you're not thinking about having sex, you're not thinking about procreating, you're thinking about running from a lion. And that's what your body does. It wants safety and security first. So it's not stealing pregnenolone, it's just down-regulating progesterone production because it's actually not needed. The problem is if you stay in the state, of course you're going to down-regulate the very hormone, the progestational hormone, that's very important for bringing oxygen and nutrients to the embryo. And if you're in that hyperadrenaline stress state, of course, that could be one of the many reasons why you have the inability to get pregnant. So if we look at adrenal fatigue and correlated with all this, you have adrenal fatigue stage one, which is just like the alarm phase, or the first phase of the, of the GAS. You have high cortisol levels, your cortisol sum is high, you have increased cortisol DHA ratio, and a DHA that's low. It's not all those, but typically high cortisol levels. You look at a lab, one level's high, all levels are high. Why would you have high cortisol levels? If you think about basic physiology, now this makes the most sense to me. I'm not sure if it does to you. If you have high cortisol levels, what is your body telling you? Listen to your body. You don't need a lab. Look at your body temperature and pulse. You have low pulse, low temperature, your hypocortisol, hypercortisol. Log your foods, log your ratios, log your frequencies. Take it throughout the day. If you see up and down fluctuations of body temperature and pulse, you, you have blood sugar regulation issues. You're not meeting your cellular needs consistently throughout the day. Why do you release cortisol from a stress? It could be many stresses, of course. I'm not just saying food, but for the purpose of this, we're talking about food. So if you don't meet your cellular needs, you're not meeting the cellular needs or T3 production, so your body can use it to produce energy. Cholesterol is going to go up. You're going to have high cholesterol levels. You're not able to synthesize it. 
the body saying, I need more energy, I need more energy, so you end up in this hypocortisol state because you're continually not meeting your demands that you're placing on your body. doesn't matter if you're working too much, you're working out, you're still not meeting your energy requirements with the right types of foods and the right frequencies and the right ratios to meet your needs. And you can see it in your body temperature and pulse, and you can feel it. So you can easily downregulate this hypocortisol state, the body's adaptation to this, by meeting your cellular needs with the right foods, ratios, frequencies, etc. We see it every day with clients. Now, if you don't do this, and you don't pull yourself out of this hypercortisol state, you'll end up in your stage two. Now, typically, the graph is your stage one is peaking. Uh, it's going up. You have high cortisol. Stage uh, one is up here, where you're kind of high. You have that high cortisol because you're releasing too much because you're, you're not meeting your cellular needs. As you come down, that's your stage two. And sometimes when you do this lab, Things can kind of look normal, but at this, at this state, you're, you have the diminished capacity to handle stress. You have an increased cortisol to DHA ratio. Now the cortisol sum is normal because they're coming down. It looks normal, but it's not actually normal. Now they base it off numbers, so you know the difference between homeostasis and stage 2, per se. And this is where they're basically in a transition. Now, once again, if you think about it, if you kind of don't continually meet your cellular needs through eating the right foods... And you can't convert cholesterol to make cortisol. You're eating foods that don't have vitamin A. Or you're not able to synthesize it. You're not taking in enough sugars to synthesize T3 or use it at the cell level. Now the body's starting to use its reserves. It was, you know, initially stimulating all these hormones to pull from there. And there wasn't enough. And now you're trying to basically in transition. And, you, and you're not able to convert. Some of your reserves are coming down, which puts you in the stage two. Now, your stage 3, and as I mentioned, the amount of T3 produced in the liver depends mainly on the amount of glucose available. So in this phase, we're saying there's really not a lot of glucose or glycogen stored in the liver, and we used up a lot of our reserves, and we've broken down a lot of tissue. Now, when you end up in the stage 3, this is low adrenal output. You have increased cortisol to DHA ratio. Your cortisol sum is low. Your DHA is low. A lot of times, you'll see low levels. This is your kind of hyperadrenaline. First was hypocortisol. Second was transition, you're kind of using your reserves, some things are actually decreasing. Stage three, you're hyperadrenaline, you're not converting cholesterol, you're vitamin A deficient, you're T3 deficient, you're not producing pregnenolone. Taking pregnenolone is going to do jack shit because you don't have the very necessary uh, conversion factors to, to convert cholesterol, so you can't produce enough cortisol. You end up in stage three, it makes sense to me, does it make sense to you? There's a lot more to it of course, but it makes so much sense. We can use food to pull us out of this. Now, of course, stage one, it, of course it takes time. I'm not going to tell you what to eat. I can't do that. It's all individualized. But you can use body temperature and pulse. You can look at our other videos. You, you can read our blogs. You can take the metabolic blueprint. But it really comes down to food frequency to downregulate the adrenaline and cortisol state to meet your cellular needs. Looking at the types of fr tropical fruits and root vegetables you're taking in, non-inflammatory proteins like I've talked about. Looking at the frequency of that, the ratios, and, and looking at body temperature and pulse to see if you're pulling yourself out of this. Stage three, the hyperadrenaline state, it takes a lot more work. It takes a lot more work because we got to really work on the storage, the conversion, and getting your body out of the state of, you know, hyperadrenaline. I need more, I need more. And to a lot, kind of get the body to understand that things are coming in and it can actually store it. But it can be healed. We do it all the time with people. It takes time. You know, I was actually just talking with a client from Australia yesterday. I've been working with him for about a year. Now, it, things didn't click till about four months ago. He was making progress, but he really started to make a lot of progress four months ago. And he came to me with all those labs. He came to me with being chronically tired and, 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 and low testosterone and all these different things. And he's doing great. And all we've done is use nutrition. Now, one more quote based on research or repeat. It's actually research taken from many people. In monkeys living in the wild, when their diet is mainly fruit, their cortisol is low. Now, I'm not saying just eat fruit or human. We're not monkeys, but their cortisol is low. Why would this be? Because we're meeting our cellular needs. We're taking in sugars to downregulate glucocorticoids, which is cortisol. And it rises when they eat a diet with less sugar. Everyone's so afraid of sugar. Carbohydrates. That's why they have high cortisol levels. And that was from, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Behe, B-E-H-I-E, -E, in 2010. Sucrose consumption lowers ACTH from tropical fruits, the main pituitary stress hormone. And that was from Clement in 2009 and Ulrich. 
in 2007. And stress promotes increased sugar and fat consumption. If animals' adrenal glands are removed so that they lack the adrenal steroids, they choose to consume more sucrose, and that was based on Laguero, L-A-U-G-E-R-O, in 2001. Stress seems to be per perceived as a need for sugar, or we could say carbohydrates. In the absence of sucrose, the right types of fruits and roots, satisfying this need with starch and fat is more likely to lead to obesity. So based off that, for me that's a very powerful uh, quote or research, whatever you want to call it, that fruits and the right types of carbohydrates meet the demands of the stress we're placing on our body in the right ratios, of course in relation to proteins and fats. Not getting enough or getting too much can be a problem. Getting the right amount can downregulate the stress response and downregulate glucocorticoid production. Hopefully you've enjoyed my clip. 30 minutes in, I'm out of here.